Oh, you can if you want. Yes, yeah, yeah. We, we will ask. Yeah. So, um, everybody, thanks for uh, the, the people who stayed for the three workshops the, the whole afternoon. This is the third uh, workshop of the School of Data Journalism uh, by um, uh, the European Journalism Center and the Open Knowledge Foundation and hosted by the, the uh, International Journalism Festival here in Perugia. We will uh, have now a great uh, training session by Mariana Santos about uh, interactive storytelling. Um, Mariana is or was with uh, ICFJ, was a fellow with ICFJ embedded at uh, in the great newsroom of La Nación in uh, Costa Rica and she's now uh, in transition to another fellowship with the uh, G JSK fellowship, is that, is that right? Um, so uh, a great uh, workshop in, in perspective, so I will leave uh, Mariana start right now. I just remind you, for those who haven't yet registered on uh, datajournalismschool.net to get all the information about the workshops, we will email that to you afterwards if you register. And don't uh, hesitate to share your impressions and what you learn on social media using the hashtag uh, DDJSchool, uh, as well as the other usual festival hashtags. Thanks, Mariana. for being here uh, after such a long day. Uh, I, I hope I can entertain you and n do not make you sleep. Thank you, uh, School of Data, for bringing me here. It's an honor and a pleasure, and I'm so amazed to have these many people uh, listen to me. So I was asked to run a session of one hour and a half of visual uh, or interactive storytelling. And to be honest with you, my goal is that you all create something, and at the end of the day, we have something to publish. But to be fair, one hour and a half is a bit short. So I'm gonna run through lots of material. Hopefully you're gonna get super injected and inspired. And I'm gonna tell you about the process of um, animation and visual storytelling using After Effects. And thank you so much. Hello. And then, okay, hello, okay. And then I will tell you about my experience um, both at The Guardian, where I used to work uh, for the last three years. This last year, I've been a fellow, like uh, he said, and I'm still, I still am. For the next couple of months, uh, I finished my fellowship. Then, after this, uh, I'm, li I'm going to Fusion. It's a new TV channel uh, in Miami that belongs to Univision. And I'm going to start a team of interactive visual storytelling, not only for TV, but for online. So the news go that go on TV, they're usually linear, and they die after you show them once or twice. And the goal is how can we repurpose these contents online and make it uh, for users to keep keep on using and uh, make it longer uh, longer tail. So can I have the presentation, please? The slides. I have a lot to tell you. <laughs> can I have the slides, please? Bambini, ragazzo. Puede andare los slide, por grazie. Okay, it worked. <laughs> so, so yeah, the last three years, uh, I was an um, interactive designer at The Guardian working with uh, amazing developers that they did all the magic, to be honest and fair. Um, I love The Guardian. It's still my favorite newspaper. And, oops. And uh, we have a chance to have very, very skilled uh, developers and journalists. So the way it works is, okay, this is our newsroom. And uh, it's quite beautiful. It's in the center of London in King's Cross. It's a four, it's seven floors, but the Guardian uh, occupies four floors. This, the first floor is like communications, admin, other projects the Guardian has, like the Guardian Jobs, uh, Soulmate, which is one of the products that most money makes to the Guardian, which is to make couples meet online. Hopefully, with the willing that you're gonna find someone as clever as you that reads the Guardian. Uh, so that's like the, the selling point and it's actually very profitable. And everything started when I first joined. This, is my, this was my boss called Alastair Dent. And I call him the visionary because uh, he was, in my opinion, the one person that was uh, driving the Guardian forward. He was really trying uh, new technologies, new approaches. And 
pushing the entire team, not only the interactive team. So when I joined, it was just me and him uh, trying to visualize data bases such as Wikileaks. That was our first project. And imagine, it was my first time in a newsroom because I was coming from advertisement. And he told me, okay, we're gonna work on a project. It's very secretive. Do not tell this to anyone. And then I saw some doors with top secret, do not enter. And this Assange was walking around, but I didn't know him by the time. And I was like, oh my God, these guys are so like hysterical. So I called my mom in Portugal, because I'm Portuguese. Mommy, I'm working on this project they call WikiLeaks. I don't even know what this is. And my mom, what? Shut up, you cannot talk about that. Okay, then I, <laughs> I realized I had to be quiet and that was like a special story. And it was like my kicking start. So I, I learned like the hard way. So after that project, uh, we were kind of uh, f fighting or a battle between us, the New York Times and Desides. We all had the access to the same data and we had to show it and tell the story the best way possible. So it was like a, a let's say, a friendly combat of who would do it best. And after that project, I, I got asked to stay and of course that was my dream job and I said yes. And then the team back in 13, was like this. Uh, we hired three more developers and we hired a journalist from the, the Times that was both a journalist, but he, know, he knew a lot and he still does about coding. And th there's a question that says, should all journalists know about coding? I think the answer, the direct answer is no, they do not need to code, but they do, they do need to know what code can make for them. So they can work with developers and have the ability to ask the developers to do certain things such as something, some, some projects I'm going to show you. So this is the way we work. I understand that not every newsroom in the world has the chance to have a multidisciplinary team, but have a team of designers and a team of journalists and eventually admin people that usually are in another building and do not get involved uh, in storytelling. So The Guardian really invests in trying to recruit journal, uh, developers who have a storytelling uh, will and goal and like they do development but with the will to tell a story with data so it's very hard to find these people but they are out there and with organizations such as hacks and hackers and other meetups that try to combine journalists and developers this currency starts to to be more more happening in more number so let me tell you about a couple of projects maybe you know some of them so the government cuts it was a big data set and we had to visualize it. And that in London, we have the chance to have a government which actually recruits all the developers from The Guardian. So the government of London has many, many amazing developers and they build websites to show data, to open data and to make it available for everybody. But what happens is that if I'm a user and I want to know more about the cuts on the budget, I'm going to this site, I can download all the PDFs, but what am I going to see? What story does it tell me? Like if I'm not a data analyst or a data expert, this is going to be full numbers and tables, quite boring and heavy. I'm not going to be able to extract the story as I would like. So I think this is the main role of journalists and designers and developers. It's how can we tell these big sets of data into stories that people that are not experts in data can still understand. This, for example, was uh, our approach to these PDFs. So this is exactly the same content, and we divided the content uh, in categories and subcategories. So there's like uh, the, the, the Department of Work and Pension that has smaller uh, departments. Here we have a whole overall picture, and this is something The Guardian loves. So we see that actually the blues and the reds are the ones that have the most money, and we see the small ones here that have ma uh, less money uh, uh, to them. The pros and cons of this. Okay, the pro is that we can have this overall picture. And the con is that we cannot actually develop further information if we are interested in these bits. And this is what print can do for you. Uh, some people um, have criticized this project from being infostatic because the, the human brain can better understand the size of a, a, a bar than the, the diameter of a circumference of a circle. But, okay, if we would show this, this data in pure bars, no, not so many people would share it, not so many people would feel excited about, let's say. This project was the most shared project at the time, 
And even the government of UK printed this out very big and they put it in their wall, just so they can see the overall picture. Okay, I'm missing a bit of getting more in-depth information. So how can we take this idea further? Because every year we have this issue, the cuts. So that's when another team comes. So this, this first project was made by the graphics team. The, the, the Guardian has three main teams of graphics. The, the graphic design team, which do breaking news. So the typical, the news, the reporter comes from the second floor, goes third floor, comes to design and say, please, you have two hours to do a graphic to go with this story. This is the typical thing. And they do it. Of course, this one was not made in two hours, a bit more. And then we have other things like, okay, we have three to five days to do a kind of story that is like actual, that is gonna prolong um, along the week. Can we do something more in depth? And then there's the second team of designers, which is from eight to 10 designers. They're called the design team. And they do everything for the web, buttons, looks, titles, when, it's, when we need the sponsorship banners and uh, special feature pages, etc. they do everything. And they are involved with uh, some design for apps as well. So here, we try to tag along that exact issue, which is, how can we get more in-depth uh, information about a certain uh, category or subcategory that we want to reach? This is like the Matryoshka's dolls of, of Russia. You know, you open one and there's another, another. So this is how it works. You click on a very big category and it explodes into small subcategories that belong there and you can have extra information. This project was made using HTML5 and JavaScript and it was made in three days by a designer that has coding skills. And then with another year and we took this uh, further away, people would say, oh, this Osborne, he does so bad cuts, uh, he doesn't know how to run the country, he's cutting the money where we most need it. And the Guardian is very keen to listen to people's opinion because it's like uh, the motto is like uh, comments for free, comments are free. And, and that's why the Guardian is open as well. If we ask people to comment on our articles, how can we sell them the content? So if comment is free, do your own cut and share it. So if Osborne was that bad, this is your opportunity to do a better job. So again, from the same um, project, from the same PDFs with all the data, we would allow you to come to the category you want and to cut in the subcategories you want, giving you an overall view of what the budget is divided on. So you would do your cuts in the places where you think that you don't need so much money. And of course, this differs if you have old family uh, members, maybe you want some money for the pensions. If you, had, if you have kids, you want money for education, etc. If you don't have uh, any of those or if, you, well, your cuts would be according to your needs. So it was interesting to see the, the articles written under this as a comments. Most of the times the most important, the most interesting, and of course you could share with your name. The most interesting parts of some stories are the comments and the discussion people take it because they take it to another level and it's very interesting. So I think visual data visualization is a way to invite people to get more immersed in the data and get uh, be part of the, the story, be part of the discussion because this is important information that are being open like in other themes as well that we need to address this uh, to get closer to the audience. Civic journalism. This, for me, this is a very interesting point, and uh, in this in this festival, it has been talked about a lot how to manage social media, how to understand social media in the anthropologic point of view, because we all have opinions, we all like to share, uh, but just because we have the channels open for communication, it doesn't mean that uh, population, especially those that, who are not journalists, will tell the truth and will uh, check their facts if if they, the sources are correct. So. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had this that uh, it was quite uh, impressive in London. I was living there and I'm Portuguese, so I never had any, um, before I never had any access with riots or disturbs or very, like, very serious issues on, uh, on the city. And back then I was at the office and we heard from Twitter that people were start putting uh, fire on buildings and our cars out of the blue. They start communicating with Blackberry saying, let's go to the street, let's start disturbing and doing riots. Actually, uh, back then there was an issue that should they address Blackberry from not having 
tell the authorities that this was going to happen. And then actually people start putting fire on cars, on buildings, on companies, and the information on Twitter just raised very, very, very high. So the Twitter was like pumping, pumping London riots. And we at the, at the newspaper were following Twitter, like, shall I go home? Can I go home? Because it was near our homes and most of us go to work by bike and we would go to have to pass by fires. And then stories such as the rioters went to the zoo and they opened a cage of the tiger and now there's a tiger in the streets and they would name your streets. And you would be like, what, really? And then you, people would be like, okay, show me, show me some, um, show me some uh, proofs. And then a, per a person would tweet a, a, a picture of a tiger in the street and in the middle of the, the euphoria and the, the fear and the stress, people would just say, oh, it's true, there's a, a tiger, you know? But the tiger actually was from Italy. Many years ago, there was a, a tiger in the street and that picture is revealed from that news. Then other stories like, um, so for instance, Paul Lewis was trying to manage the tweets and uh, retweeting what he confirmed was true. And we couldn't just, as a newspaper, we couldn't just retweet everybody and uh, it showed to be very hard to to report on this theme using civic journalism like people that would just tweet using the hashtag london riots or the places where the the riots were happening so what simon rogers did and he used to run the data blog of the guardian now he's at twitter i think he's going to be here friday he decided okay uh, there's always this theme when we do a project if we ask users to sign in uh, to the Guardian, we make a barrier of, so if there are 100 people that want to post something, if we ask them to log in, maybe 40 people would do something. And we know this is a, a barrier. We have to make our users not to think and not to do extra work and not to click more than they need. But here actually it was in our favor because we wanted people to tell us what's happening in their streets, but committing, like if they're gonna tell us something and if they have to do login, they're going to invest time because we're going to request them to do so. So we start asking people, tell me where you are by geolocated points and tell me, uh, write a couple of lines of what's happening if you have pictures even where. So after uh, checking if those facts were true, we start pointing them out. And this is totally automatic using Google Maps. It's a very easy way to, with a form, you ask people and then you have to uh, confirm before you, you allow it to be posted. But this was very easy to do. And then at the third day, we had lots of content. We created a database uh, fed by the users that we decided to showcase on, on trails of destruction around London. And this was interesting because this was made by, by people, by civic journalists. Then what we did, I'm gonna have a film. Uh, what we did was, um, okay, we want to do a study about this. And this was not breaking news at, at, at all. I don't know if this is going to have some. Um, this was, let's study what just happened in London. This time was the best, the far, far, far away, the most tweeted event in London. And uh, we wanted to study this in an anthropologic way. And it was like a couple of months after the riots happened. And at the same time, we were in contact with the uh, uh, University of St. Andrews. And they wanted to study um, the sentiment, sentiment analysis of a tweet, let's say. If you tell me the London riots, the, the rioters went to the zoo and opened the cage to the tiger and there's a tiger in the street. And if I reply to you, yeah, right, the sentiment analysis will see, yeah, positive, right, it's positive. So it will say plus, plus, it's plus, I'm agreeing with you. And actually, I'm not agreeing with you, I'm being ironic and I'm using senses of human language that are telling that I do not agree with you and I want some proofs. So the, this uh, sentiment analysis algorithm totally failed and we failed with the project and then we had to do everything by hand. Let me see if I can play this video. Do I have sound? This is not my sound. The England riots were the worst bout of civil unrest in a generation. Thousands of people took to the streets in towns and cities. The fires, looting and clashes with police gave the impression of a country at war with itself. And one big tenet of this project was to look at social media and particularly Twitter. We wanted to ask the question, how was Twitter used during the riots? The riots were arguably the most tweeted event in the UK at that point. Many people had experienced the riots through a lens of Twitter. 
Our challenge was to find a way to show the birth and death of rumours on Twitter. In other words, to give a sense of how misinformation corrects itself in an open, unregulated forum such as Twitter. The result is one of the most ambitious pieces we have ever built, both in terms of data analysis and dynamic graphics. Our source material was a corpus of 2.6 million tweets provided by Twitter which related to the riots by virtue of a series of hashtags. We identified seven key rumours ranging from the frivolous, that army tanks had been deployed in the City of London, to the more sobering, that the Tottenham riots began with the police beating a 16-year-old girl. The key inspiration was actually fluorescent microscopy, which is a scientific method that helps us to understand cellular phenomenon, um, puts things under a microscope, colours them either red or green to show you how they change over time. We decided to show tweets as circles grouped into larger circles. Each larger circle contained a set of tweets that were all retweets of a given tweet, effectively votes in favour of or against a particular rumour. The sizes of the circles varied according to how many followers the author had. With help from an interdisciplinary team of researchers at the universities of Manchester, St Andrews and Leicester, we distilled the overall corpus down to a series of subsets related to each rumour. One of the technical challenges that we had to overcome was to analyse the relationships between different tweets, which ones were retweets of earlier ones. And that involves a number of different comparisons to be made between these tweets. Because it's two and a half million, that is quite a significant number. Each tweet was then independently coded by three sociology PhD students in order to establish whether it supported, opposed, queried or commented on a rumour. The animated graphics are produced using web standards, which means they work across many devices in multiple browsers. A graph of tweet volume over time, for instance, is drawn in SVG or VML, depending on browser capability. Five so this was uh, a study on the relations of people on Twitter, and uh, it was used, uh, as he was saying, HTML, JavaScript, and tried to work in all devices. So it was kind of a challenge in terms of technology. It took more than four, uh, four weeks to build, and it was a test drive to go if we see collaboration. Of course, it's very hard to teach in a workshop how to do this because you need people that have skilled um, uh, uh, development skills and the time we have is not enough. But I wanted to show you like what can be done. Then, for example, this is an animation. Now this is driving to the part that I really want to talk to you about because this is something we could do if we will have four hours. We could all do an animation like this. This is um, a new trend, let's say, for the last three, four years. Um, when I first did this project was in 2010, to be honest, was when I first joined The Guardian. I came from an animation background and Simon Rogers again, he gave me this data set and he said, look, can you, anim can you do something, uh, visualize this data that is quite boring? And I tried to do this with the direct art director, Michael Robinson, and when I finished, uh, I presented it to our executive director, uh, editor, and he said, okay, it's okay, I, I kind of like it, but we never published something like this, so I'm not gonna put this live, as I don't know how our audience is gonna react, so no, we're not gonna publish. And I was like so sad because like, I, I was totally uh, sure that this is a good way to present something either a bit dull or boring or even too complex to, to, to invest uh, so much time if you don't know if you want to read that, for instance. And after a couple of months, the New York Times started producing animations and that same person said, Mariana, can you do once a week one of these because the, the clicks and the viewers just, just just blown. It's really, really effective with the audience. And I said, <laughs> okay, one week is too much. Like, uh, I need a team at least to, to do once a week, but I can do once every two or three weeks. Anyway, I started doing lots of animations like this with the other themes like um, uh, the crisis, the uh, riots, whatever theme, uh, actually sports, arts, culture. So it was proven that this had more clicks than a piece uh, even we did once, which was Boris dancing Gangnam Stan, uh, you know that music? And it took me like uh, literally 15 minutes to produce an animation and it was the most clicked project ever. But of course that was a joke and we don't want to do journalism just, just like that. But this was proven to be very effective because first, I didn't need to debug and we do not need to debug, which is the thing that takes lots of time. You produce an animation uh, having a script, usually written by a journalist, 
about a certain theme, and then you, you collaborate journalist and a designer or an animator or an illustrator to come up with the visuals for that story. And that's how it all began. And then I was getting scripts from all over the newsroom, and they would sit with me, they would give me a couple of weeks, and they would say, okay, this is the story. How can we visualize? And most often than not, I would ask them their opinion and uh, ask how can we visualize it. So that's my workshop. It's to tell you how you can produce these animations. Um, this is very not complicated. You, you have to believe in, in that. Of course, it takes a bit of time to learn After Effects, which is the main animation tool I use. Uh, it's an Adobe program. Uh, but the main thing is that if you are a journalist and you want to have your stories being told in an animation way, and if you have a chance to work with a designer, I'm sure you can co-work with a designer for him because he would know Adobe anyway, and the Adobe pro pro uh, programs are very similar. So here's the workshop. <laughs> and then I have a couple of examples as well. So first of all, and I will pass this presentation to Milena, and then you can have it if you want. Uh, the main thing to, to, to touch first thing is who are you talking to? Because I've done animations for about crisis, about politics, or about culture, or about uh, gifts for Christmas, <laughs> the most various things you can imagine. And we need to, tell, to know who are we addressing. The same with our chronics, the same with our reports. Animation goes on your mobile, goes on your iPad, on desktop, on a click. It is not meant to replace the story especially because it's meant to be short, fast, and uh, kind of a, a teaser to invite the audience to read further or to, to learn more about this story. So it's not replacing. This is very important to know. Then the script presentation. Usually, and every time I do an, uh, an animation for a journalist, he comes up with a, uh, a novel, you know, lots and lots of text. That to animate this text, it's going to take ages. So we have to reduce the story and the script to the minimal, barely essentials. Imagine what I usually say is, try to write a script that you can read in one minute and a half when you, when you read out loud and you record the, the timing in your phone. And if that happens, we, we, ha we are good to go. Usually they take like six, seven, five, uh, five to upwards minutes. And it's proven after like uh, tens of animations that people, and this, has been, this number has been decreasing, so a couple of years ago, after one minute and 30, people would close the window. No matter if the, the animation was 30 minutes uh, or 30 sec uh, I mean, or five minutes, they would close after 1.30, like 80% of the viewers would close the window. So why should we do animations of three, five, 10 minutes? It's not the purpose. If we want to do a longer version, that's a short film or there's a documentary. There's a different medium. So this is, invite, this is the story, this is the, the, the bullet points that I'm most uh, interested and concerned on telling you about. And then if you want to know more, read the story or check our infographic or uh, explore the data. Then another thing, think with images. Um, text is good for us to go in, the, in, in deep, to, to learn our information in deep, but the first touch, it has to be visual. Because especially, imagine, our, our personas are like those that go from work, from home to work, on a bus or on a public transport, and they just want to get the, so they wake up, first thing they do, it's catch the phone, maybe check some uh, apps that tell you the biggest stories of that day. This is our audience, and we want to be in that feed of the, the best stories. So if there is a big story that had lots of investigation, we want to be their feature as a small movie that just catch your attention. This is what you're going to learn if you read the, the story or if you get immersed. So this is where we want to be. So start thinking with images. I know for journalists, um, sometimes it's hard this part because they want designers to think in images and they think in words. But if you start trying to do that exercise, it's incredible, it's powerful. Like I had the chance to work with very good investigative journalists. I would never thought they would give, my, give me their time on thinking with imagery, and they did, and sitting side by side, like, I, I, I think with images, and they think with words. So when we combine, we have so many different approaches, and this is very complex, and it's really uh, engaging uh, to see the differences and find out what's the best for our audience. So allow yourself to think with images. Ah, and then one, another thing, journalists say, I cannot draw, <laughs> most of them. 
Yes, you can. And you can do these uh, balls with a, a stick and two sticks, and it's a sticky man. You can. This is a representation. And some designers say uh, the, the, the closest path to your mind is your hand. So your hand connects to your, to your brain, and you can produce much better than just say, you know, I want you to do something like that. Just draw it, and it's much more effective. And then be organized, like I am the first not being so organized, but uh, with these workshops, I, and when people work together, this is very important. You have, um, uh, you have folders for everything, for the script, for the assets, which are usually the images you're going to use. Then you have the voiceover, which you can record yourself. I'm going to tell you how. And then you have different versions of the animation. And then you have the final animation. You need to have a project manager, even if you are working with another designer, one of you guys have to be the project manager. You have to be um, responsible for the conclusion of the project for, okay, we have the deadline, we're gonna meet it, no matter what, if you, even if you can sleep the last couple of days, and that happens most of the times. Uh, I just like to say this, um, when people say, is journalism dying because of the internet is killing journalism? I don't think so, I think it's the opposite, especially with this, uh, open channels of communication. I think journalists and the practice of journalism is more important than ever. Now that everybody can speak out loud, now that all voices can be heard, now that the internet is full of information over and over coming, even if it's 5% that is worth checking and the rest is like spam, journalists have this role of making sure that the information that goes live is real and it's uh, confirmed. So I think just the future is digital, as well as Martin Barham. Um, I just think journalism is stronger and in need more than ever. So I mentioned these timings. Uh, we should not go too much uh, more than one minute and a half if you don't want to waste your time, because if you are not going to create something more, nobody, I mean, a very small percentage is going to read. Just those, in my case, my friends and my family are those who are really, really interested in knowing everything about their theme. Uh, a general audience would close because they want uh, more uh, in stimul stimulations in a shorter period of time. Voiceover. So this is everything we could do to here today, <laughs> if time would allow. But uh, Sound, uh, SoundCloud teamed up with this, uh, this software called PCM Recorder. And this is uh, very easy to use. This was, is what the Guardian uh, Multimedia uses when they do interviews in the streets. They, they record interviews. This is much powerful than uh, your own single microphone in your smartphone. Uh, so for this, you just start here and it grabs the environment sound and then you wait five seconds and then you press the green and you start talking. Either if it's an, an interview in the street or a concert or whatever, I use it for voiceover. So I go into an, uh, onto a, a, a closed room with not so much noise. Usually I go with the, with the journalist and the journalist reads out loud uh, his script. I, I never do because I never worked in Portuguese. I, or, I, I always have been working in English or Spanish and both of them are not my mother language, so I, c I, I would not be a good voiceover. Especially because you need to be an actor narrating it's, it might sound dull, especially for journalists. And I have this funny story. I was once doing a, a political, it was a political review, and I did an animation about it. And then uh, the, the, the project manager told me, can you record the voice of this editor because he's very famous and it's gonna be much better to have his own voice in his own words and story. I said, okay. We went into the multimedia room and first I was, quite new at the company, so I didn't know everybody. And I asked, I, I did this stupid question, do you work here? And he was like, what? He was like there for 20 years, one of the most known journalists in the field. And me, like a, a brand new intern, uh, didn't know him. But I was like, okay, can you please read this with attitude? Like if you are an actor, it doesn't, if you are reading something sad, you cannot laugh, of course. Uh, that's not the point, but you cannot read like this, otherwise it's gonna be very boring. And that was, the way he would do it, and I, trying to put, to make a senior person, editor, uh, push his boundaries, it was so hard because he was like, girl, don't make me look funny, I don't want to look funny, I want to look serious, this is a serious team. At, at the end of the story, the, the, the script was amazing, the story was uh, visual attractive, 
the voiceover was so dull that the project failed totally. So this is very important to take in mind. So resources for journalists that say they don't know how to draw. This project, the non-project, was a hackathon made by Chris Wu with a couple, with a bunch of designers and journalists saying, we're gonna do a hackathon without computer. This is about drawing by hand. So when we say, can you draw me a tree? A person from the Alps will, go, will draw a tree different from a person from Brazil, for instance, or from Costa Rica. So that was like designing by hand, how you imagine a tree. And then of course, designers would make, convert these into vectors just so you can use these information, these icons, not only in your stories, as well as in your animations, infographics, etc. The way it works, it's free. You, ha you can have a paid account if you want without crediting anyone. And if you want to have a free account, uh, you can download all of the icons. You just have to credit them at the end saying, this is from the non-project and this was designed by John Smith, for instance. And that's it. Even if you are doing an animation, you can pass it very fast. Just as a kind of uh, kindness, nobody's going to check if you credit or not. It's a kind of a kindness. Another way to find your information is dafont.com. This is a site to download fonts. Most of them are for free. Actually, everything is for free. Some are for only personal use. But these, actually, this is A, B, C, D, A, F. But they, they are called, um, uh, they are icons inside of letters. So when you open them in, a, in Adobe Illustrator, you can convert them to a JPEG or a PNG. They come in SVG, which is, uh, or, or actually they come in a font and you can convert them to SVG or to Adobe Illustrator, which is what we use to do animations. So again, you can find all your icons uh, here. Uh, in Dingbats, there's a part there that says Dingbats, and there's, among fonts, you have these icons. This is very, very cool, and this is what I wanted to test with you. Uh, but I see most of people don't have a computer. But this is a, a very cool tool. Do, do I have internet here? This is called Storyboard That. Let me see if I have internet. Do you have the... Ah, it's open? Is it? Okay, just showing you how easy it is. It's resolving host. Is this uh, yeah. open? Oh. Thanks. Continue. Okay, check this out. This is for journalists to communicate with designers in the very effective way when you have something in your mind that you want to pass. If you don't want to draw, you can use this software if the internet allows me. Yeah, it's resolving. Okay, otherwise I will leave it to explore, but I wanted to show you how easy it is. Okay, so create a storyboard. This is free as well. Maybe we are all online, that's why it's a bit slow. I think I pass and you can try this, it's just you can uh, drag and drop uh, backgrounds, people, text, you can do a storyboard with these features and you don't have to even draw, you can, they draw everything for you. I think I'm going to pass because it's taking too long and I have lots of things to tell you. So this is the software used, it's actually paid software, uh, I don't, I, okay, Adobe Illustrator, there are some open software for vectorial, like uh, GIMP and some others. After Effects I still haven't seen. I know that Infogram are, are coming up with a new tool for doing video on demand in the future. But so far I do everything uh, using this software. And this is something if you would like uh, in four hours we could get the basics of this software and you could build your own animation. And this is what I've been trying to, to do in newsrooms in Latin America. Then 
after the voiceover, you can as well have uh, some music uh, banks where you can download music for free, such as Jamendo, Free Play Music, Audio Jungle. You can make it uh, happy, sad, uh, upbeat, cinema cinematic, etc. You find lots of tools and, and uh, resources. The same way you find in the font and non project, you find free uh, soundtracks here. Again, I'm going to pass this presentation. I'm going to tweet it or pass it to, to Milena. And tutorials. This is how I learn After Effects. And nowadays, I'm a professional on animation. Everything I learned, I didn't go to school to learn this. And I think most of the, the, the skills, we can grab it by ourselves. Like, we have the access to the internet. And nowadays, there are lots of people very generous sharing what they know and doing you step by step. Even if we start from scratch, we can find all the small steps. and. Um, when I was my first job on my life was a motion designer at Universal Music. I started as a graphic designer to make the covers of the CDs, and I found that to be so boring. And my boss was doing animation for music stars on TV, and I loved that. And he said, "Okay, if you really want to do this, take these DVDs." And he gave me DVDs with tutorials. Learn it. And this is a project from Mariah Carey. Do it. You have three, uh, four, four weeks. And I said, oh my God, I don't know how to do it, but I really wanted to grab the opportunity. So, okay, this is like more advanced tutor tutorials, but learning these tutorials, tutorials and making, having a project that I could actually produce really launched uh, my wheeling and I, I didn't sleep most of the time. I gave up on sleep to be able to catch up with this uh, technology and it worked. And if you devote like two or three hours per day, I tell you, in, in a week, you can start producing something. And if you do these intensive workshops we do in four, day, in four hours, you can start producing something. And then if you want to be a kick-ass animator, the, the, you have advanced classes here, and these are all free. So no excuses. Let me show you an example of a project that I've been working on. And this is to, sh to tell you how possible it is. So uh, the entire year, I've been working uh, in different Latin American newsrooms from Colombia, Mexico, uh, Costa Rica, uh, Chile, Brazil, uh, Argentina, etc. And they all share the same thing. They want to learn. They want to catch up. They see Europe and the United States as when we grow up, we want to be like them. But actually, they can be like us right now. They have the skills, they have the hands, and they have the minds and the ideas. And they, most of all, they have the articles. They have amazing corruption that they, they do outstanding um, investigations and then they have a problem how to com communicate this visually. Like they usually do big, big text formats and they need to catch up with online. So how can they do that? So uh, my, my fellowship, International Center for Journalists, sent me out uh, to work with these newsrooms, trying to do what I was doing at The Guardian. So La Tercera, for instance, it's a newspaper um, that did not do teamwork and I tried to go there and implement that with them. The, this guy is called Miguel Paz. He launched a project called Poderopedia. Uh, it's a platform to match relationships between politicians and uh, business people and people with power and money, which often can be pointed out of being involved in corruption cases. And he's trying to map it out. He started in Chile, now he's in Venezuela, Panama, soon in Colombia, Mexico, Brazil, etc. So the overall goal is to map the entire uh, corruption scene or the possible corruptive, uh, corrupt people. So he put, like, and this is all about connections. So he knew the scenery of newsrooms in, in Chile and he suggested me as a fellow to work in the Tercera newspaper. I must say, most of the Latin American newsrooms I found, they were extremely humble. But humble to the point of saying, we would like to do this, but we can't. They cut themselves. Like, before starting, they are already quitting. And I really didn't like that because, and this was their, the, like, they, they got me a meeting, let's say what this girl has to say, but actually, you know what? We not, look at this guy. This is the designer. He's like, what am I doing here? I'm going to waste my time. I'm not going to do anything, you know? Like, uh, the goal was, we have a big story, which is the 40 years of Coupe d'Etat in Chile. How can we tell this story? 
so they call me and let's uh, do this amazing, uh, the goals were uh, we want to do a snowfall or we want to do this guardian firestorm thing. They, they, they like these forms of narratives, but they said we would love one day in our lives to have the chance of learning how to do it, but we don't know and we're not going to be able to do. And I was like, yes, you can. <laughs> And I, I say that not because I coded these projects, but because I've been involved in the process, so I know how it takes and who it takes and what technology. And this is what we need to be familiar with. It doesn't mean that we all need to code, but we need to know how to make these projects and then work with the persons that, like developers that know how to do HTML and JavaScript, etc. And so we can write a narrative to fit that technology. So... <laughs> when plans fail. <laughs> so I was all positive, this is going to be like at the Guardian, everybody does, does their, their thing, and actually they don't. So first of all, we were counting on these amazing journalists, he's like the most famous journalist in Chile, uh, about the Coup d'Etat. He's so famous that he now uh, left the paper, the, his office at the paper, and he built an entire building of consultancy, and he's a writer, a writer he, like, he writes lots of books, and he's named as the master of the coup d'etat. He knows all the secrets and he's still investigating after 40 years. And you know what? He uh, doesn't have Twitter, for instance. And we said, why don't you have Twitter? Because I know there's lots of people hating me and they're gonna talk bad about me in Twitter, so I'd rather not see it. This is his, his attitude towards digital. And so we were asking, okay, uh, the plan would be, because they are very focused on print, they said, let's, let's do a 20, uh, one days before the coup d'etat, the preparation, what happened, etc., for print, and that was an excuse for me to be working with them in digital. Actually, our hidden plan is that we wanted to do something very big in digital, and we would do eventually something for print just to please the managerial levels, which was uh, what they most wanted. So we were there, uh, we asked the guy, can you write the story? He's like, yeah, 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 in two days I give you the story. Okay, I was there for one month, the two days passed. And then uh, we were like, okay, one more day, three days, four days. I lost one week without the, the script. So we called him, we said, can we have a meeting again? He said, okay. So he came one hour late. He left us waiting one hour late. This is how different it is from London. And then when he came, we were talking about, uh, so can you give us the script when you're going to give us? And he was, he was like very relaxed. And he said, you know what? I didn't even start it. And when I started, I'm going to give you this one week before the actual launching of the project. And we were like, what? <laughs> this was the face of the girl. She was like, I want to kill this guy. Because he really didn't respect us, <laughs> didn't respect the team. Like me as a Portuguese, I wanted to say everything that came in my mind. And I was like, I swallowed the frog because I was not in my place. I should shut up. Uh, and then, OK, this was no time to waste. We have to put hands on work. What's our plan B? We have no turning back. So what happens is that she went, uh, she had uh, like five interns. They went through all the, the investigations about the coup d'etat to try to find out what's no, no, uh, new stories. Like, because after 40 years to tell the same story is quite hard. And the goal was, we want to do a snowfall, but we have no idea. And I said, let's do a snowfall. Let's take this project that most likely is going to fail because we already had this big issue of not having the story. Let's take this as an exercise. Don't forget about the final product. Let's exercise ourselves to work together. What, what do you like to do more? So we try to get uh, the, the best of everyone. So having this chance of let's do whatever we can, uh, these guys showed us, oh, I love illustrations, I love collage, I love to, to do artistic stuff. Okay, let's grab that. So just so they were so like humble and in the sense the designers would walk in the newsroom like this. They don't have any freedom to tell their ideas, to, to share their, their goals and dreams. They don't have, they, it's really oppressive that environment. So let's do design thinking in team. And this was the first thing uh, we did that. So the, this girl, uh, Macarena, she did the script with her interns. Uh, in, in one day, she did the first two hours of the, of the day before the, at the, the bombing. And so we reduced the scope because of the limitations we had. It was our plan B. Instead of 21 days, we're going to have 24 hours before the, 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 the bombing. So we start designing those two hours of script that actually were like 10 pages. So this was the beginning. 10 pages, two hours, we start imagining how um, a snowfall would work, even though they don't know HTML, they start imagining how things would come into the screen. So, and they start becoming very creative, 
they had freedom in, those room, in that room to think and to dream whatever they wanted. And they start drawing and planning and discussing happened. For the first time, they were allowed to discuss ideas and different points of view. And it's very nice Chilean discussion. Two designers, no, actually three designers. And they, okay, they had different opinions and that was very nice to see that for the first time they had the chance to, to, to share ideas and not be oppressive, oppressed. And then uh, I asked them, at the last day I was there, they asked me, can you do a pitch of your work and um, to, the, to the journalists? So we had a room similar like this. And I asked the guys the night before, look, whatever we conclude these three weeks of work, can you do a pitch to show? Because we had this problem. In, in terms of polit politic uh, issues, we had to make sure we would say the same number of times we would say Pinochet, we would say Allende. And who's the bad, who's the good depends on who's reading it. So it's a very sensible theme. We were very close from not having this published. So they were afraid because the theme was very sensible. They were afraid because the journalists usually do not let them think. And they were trying something totally out of their comfort zone, uh, which they were not uh, sure if this was the good path. They, so they did a pitch for the first time. So they start showing the process. So the storyboard, a little bit more hand-drawn. And then I tell you, the guy that came into the, to the stage to, to present, he came like this. I'm sorry, guys. I know this is uh, not complete. Please forgive us. Like this, totally uh, saying forgiveness, asking for forgiveness. This is a sketch, and this is what they produced. In like a couple of hours, they put this together. El Gap, Hugo García, contesta el teléfono en la casa presidencial de Tomás Moro. La gravedad del mensaje lo lleva a despertar al presidente Salvador Allende, quien contesta la llamada. Es el subdirector de Carabineros, Jorge Urrutia. Acaba de recibir inquietantes noticias desde Valparaíso. La infantería de Marina está en las calles y ha comenzado a tomar posiciones de combate. Efectivamente, a la hora que el presidente Allende es alertado, y tal como estaba previsto, El golpe de estado ya ha comenzado en el principal puerto del país. A poco más de 100 kilómetros de Santiago, pronto, Valparaíso y sus alrededores caen bajo el control de los hombres del almirante José Toribio Merino, principal organizador de la asonada IX. Well, this was what they put together in a couple of hours before the meeting. At this time, the journalists start applauding them out of nothing and like it was a big moment. Maybe for us, in our reality, this doesn't mean anything because we, are, we have freedom of speech and we can share our ideas, but they couldn't. And this was a proof for them as, okay, we can think by ourselves as well. So then they, they kept on going. I did project manager over Skype because as they, this was the first time they were working together, for them it was hard to, to find if they were in a good path or not. And okay, this is funny. And just to explain that we can actually do managing by Skype and it works if we have clear directions and the goal where we want to get. And then they get, they got so confident, they start developing for like, and that for me was the best part is that they gain self-confidence in their work. So they start designing and as you can think, taking the best out of people, this guy was an ama is an amazing illustrator and we tried to empower that from him. And because he was so passionate about drawing, these things came naturally. It, he was zero under pressure. He was in his comfort zone doing something out of his comfort zone. So it was a combination. And as that was like one of my main goals uh, on trying to experiment uh, with their uh, visual heritage, I think this uh, was a cool project for them to put in practice what they know. So, and then uh, they didn't know how to do stuff like a snowfall, but then out of settle, they learn how to do an iPad version by themselves, by l reading tutorials and watching movies. And they developed, like this was just before, a couple of weeks before they launch. So a couple of weeks before they launch, they changed management. And they changed to a team that didn't care about this story, that said, we're not gonna publish, we don't care about these. And uh, the tone, we want to defend the parts, and this is not defending. Anyway, I, I flew myself there and I, I was so, so, so afraid they wouldn't publish because that would ruin all the work these guys put together and the confidence they gained would be destroyed. 
So I called the guardian and I said, look, there's this project made by this team. The project is amazing. Can you please publish? Check if you like it, of course. And if you like it, please publish. We give you all the con content and credits and everything and you publish. The guardian loved it and they got pissed with me because I didn't tell in the first day. I just told in the last moment. Um, because they could have a better way of using uh, the coding here. Like the, the Chilean team decided to do a loading everything before you start the experience and that requires two minutes waiting and the Guardian cannot tolerate that. So the Guardian could have access, uh, make a, um, a consultancy kind of thing, helping them to use PHP or other languages to make this uh, load as you go along the page. So, so the Guardian published. Uh, I, as well, other fellows asked another paper to publish. So at the end of the day, La, La Tercera uh, had to publish as well. Otherwise, it would be very embarrassing. The reaction was like amazing. They never had worked together and they loved it. Like, and under certain stress situations, if you can rely on your colleagues and you know they're going to do the best, you can do your work the best way you can without having to micromanage everybody. And this was what happened. And then... Uh, of course, we had lots of team spirit, and they said, after this, we're going to do more together. And this is the project, but because the internet is kind of failing, let me see if I can. This, so they end up doing it in Spanish and English. Okay, it's going to take ages. But if you have the chance to check this project, it's called uh, 11 September, septiembre, 1973.latercera.com and dot uh, slash s or slash uh, um, a E N for English. And I think that's all for now. Yes, that's all for now. Um, I don't know if I have any questions or if we can run to, through any software you'd like me to drive you through. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry if I spoke too fast, but I, I wanted to tell you all this and I had more to tell you. Uh, but this, I think this is a proof that yes, we can. And uh, Latin American newsrooms are very eager to catch up with technology, to catch up or with storytelling, and they are open to these kind of uh, workshops and, and work together for a month and then go on by yourself. And they've been doing amazing projects. I have like tons more that I could show. But due to the limited time, I, I welcome you to write me and I can send you lots of links about the projects uh, that have been developed there. And I think they managed to arrive to the same level of um, a snowfall, but with their own style, which I think it's amazing to be able to use your own style and your heritage. Is there any question or anything you want to say? Say again? Yes, I will give the slide to Milena and she will send to you our tweet. You get everything. So you work for The Guardian, and can you tell us uh, what were the main feedback that you received from your work? And um, do you think that these kind of models can work in Italy? Uh, you mean when I was working at The Guardian? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, it's a bit, um, uh, the situation of uh, Italy, I know you have crisis and so do we in London, or do they in London, do we in Portugal? Uh, the thing is, like, there was a big, big investment from the Guardian newspaper to be digital first and most of all mobile first. And the goal was to be disruptive with the technology. Like, they would allow us, so my team would be the third team, we would be from five to seven people, and we would a be asked to do non breaking news that would be totally disruptive and that would be serving not so much as, okay, we're going to have lots of users coming to see this piece, because it was pretty. The targeting to audiences who are very keen to browse data, interesting in technology, and it's a minority, to be honest. And the time and money it requires, it's pretty high. So it's not an investment that can be done by any newspaper. Uh, I, I'm, I believe the newspapers in Italy are not like uh, parting on money. So it's very, it's not only uh, a trying to reach out for future of technology, but as well as a, a, re a public relation movement. Because when, uh, when we do some, uh, such projects, it's not that we're going to have lots of clicks or lots of viewers, it's that people are going to talk about The Guardian through these projects. The same way 
uh, Snowfall, it's a brand for New York Times, if you don't know. Maybe some people don't know New York Times and they know the Snowfall project. So it's a driving. And the money, so the way we calculate um, it's the, man, the metrics, is the money we would invest in advertisement, the same way we are mentioned with these kind of projects, uh, would be much higher. So it's an investment, not only to try out technology, that then we can have the code in GitHub and have it used by other teams, but as well, uh, a relation, um, public relation for the world to spread the word, the Guardian, and this is the project, and then try to get some prizes because that's as well very good for reputation. So I, I believe not, not so many newspapers are in this position. Uh, the New York Times, for instance, uh, they have a, a team of 40 to do what we were trying to do with five or seven people. In the US, we are, there are four people doing the same. So we do much less projects, but we still invest in these like, it's like top tech, techie projects. There is uh, this gentleman here in the third row. Uh, now I can show you the project. Um, you know what, you are at the top of the pyramid and of course all of this is really interesting. But uh, when you're talking about snowfalls and you're making a kind of comparison with what happened at La Tercera, I have the impression that uh, you're giving a message like you can do it even though you don't have a big team or stuff like this. You know, that's quite difficult because everyone is dealing with this kind of revolution, also the local newspapers. So everyone is trying to find its way. At, at the basic level of the pyramid, uh, the only chance is to find some good apps and something that is pretty useful so that you don't need a whole staff, a bunch of people. Like uh, during the Olympics, the New York Times made uh, uh, a kind of uh, scroll kit animation for explaining some strange winter sports and it was great. Then you see the credits for every single work there were between 10 and 12 people working on it. So we are saying, oh my God, and that's the only thing that I can say. So if someone is developing some good apps or good software that we can use, we can also have a chance, but without this, only the big cor media corporation will survive. You are right. I'm absolutely in agree with you. Um, in Latin America, for instance, it's the same case. Like most of newsrooms uh, don't even have enough people to try to have a developer, designer, and a journalist. How can they have 10 people working on a project? There are many, many software uh, online. Uh, of course, The Guardian try uses those as well for breaking news. Uh, but we try with, because The Guardian, I tell you, it's becoming more a development company uh, and it's quite scary to see your, I don't know, the decisions being made. Like when I, when I started, we were 42 developers. When I left, we were 180. And in the same time, the journalists are leaving because we, they cannot fire journalists because there's a union, but they can ask for, um, uh, how do you say, voluntary redundancy. So we are cr increasing the development and decreasing the journalists. So how it's going to work in the future? So, and I know not every company or newspaper, especially the small ones can do that. But if you have the will to try, for instance, um, there are so many tools out there that you can use. You just have to, and most of the journalists in Latin America, they are willing to give me whatever tool you have that is for free that I can self, uh, th that I can learn myself. Uh, because I don't have access to the big de developers, but this is starting with the will, the will to want to use. And if you want, I can send you a list of uh, open, uh, free platforms where you can do data visualization in many different forms. Um, we do, I don't know if you know, but I, I run a project called Chicas Poderosas uh, together with School of Data, and we do exactly this training, not only training to do uh, feature projects like these, like tailored by hand and you design the app and you build it. But as well, we open up for tools that are open, free and easy to use. And you as a journalist do not have to know 
uh, in in depth HTML or JavaScript because it's pretty straightforward. You have a tutorial. If you devote a couple of hours, you will be able to do such as Google Fusion Tables, Open Refine, which is uh, allows you to scrape data and then clean the database and then feed it into the Fusion Tables and have your uh, data visualized. There are other libraries a little bit more sophisticated that you have to invest a little bit more time, such as D3. But, and again, I, I mentioned uh, Infogram again. Uh, they are here represented by Nikki. He's there, she's there. And it's like new software, new uh, tools that enable journalists to, to visualize their information more quickly. Uh, most of the times, uh, at La Nation, where I used to work lately, we had a database. And to see the trends and to see if there's something catchy out there, we would use Google Fusion Tables like this. You, 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 you put the data into Fusion Tables and you visualize and you can immediately see if there's a pattern of what happens if you match uh, databases, you know. And these kind of tools, okay, they are not as easy as, for instance, Storyboard, that is really, really easy. Requires a bit of self-training, but if you invest that, you can reach that. And we can do everything, of course, uh, to do a level of a snowfall, uh, it's it's art piece, I would say. It's like big, big investment, much bigger than we do at the Guardian. It's like eventually six months, uh, an helicopter to go over the mountains, uh, you know, to film these angles. So this is another level. But still, we can tell stories that are not at th that level of artistic uh, approach, but still tell a story and engage with our audiences. That's what I believe. Something else. <laughs> you want to add something? No, I guess the, the, the lesson I learned is that you can do it, but you won't sleep. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> she mentioned a couple of times she lost nights. Um, thank you so much, Mariana, for your, your engaging presentation and all, for all the tips. Uh, again, we're taking notes. Uh, we're going to circulate all the presentations. Um, and you'll have all the resources people mentioned. Uh, remember that there are many tutorials online to use all these tools that Mariana mentioned. So don't be discouraged. That's the, that's the main message. Even if you don't have to sleep or you lose a couple of nights of sleep, don't, don't be discouraged and, and keep pushing and keep going. Uh, so with this, we are closing our glorious first day of School of Data Journalism. We thank you all, especially those of you who sat through all the sessions and workshops and panels. We really, really appreciate your effort to learn and, and come here. And we know it's not easy. And you must be brain fried and, and you really need a break. And uh, we appreciate that a lot. We're very, very grateful. And we hope you learned something. We hope you'll continue practicing. And we hope we'll see most of you tomorrow. Tomorrow we start at 9. Uh, we start with a panel discussion uh, moderated by Antoine about how to do data journalism in small rooms, in small newsrooms. So it's, it's again going back to the same question, what do you do if you don't have all these resources? Uh, and then we'll continue in the afternoon with some more workshops. Um, so subscribe on datadrivenjournalism.net if you haven't uh, done so. Tweet at us your impressions from the day and see you tomorrow. Thanks. Bye -bye.